Good morning. Welcome to Good Shepherd. I'm Lucy Rodzina. Join me in this call to worship. Welcome. Open your hearts to God's love this day. Praise be to God who has called us here. Let the words wash over you and offer you healing and hope. Praise be to God who continually blesses us. Place your hope and trust in God. With joyful hearts, we come to worship and praise God who continually blesses and provides for us. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are holy, hallowed be. Great Spirit, who breathed life into the world, Lord, we need your strength. Hallelujah, is God with us? God is with the stranger, feeding those in need, giving water to the thirst. Show us love and justice, forgiveness make the peace, make mercy come to violence, and set the captives free. Jesus taught us to love one another. Christ our shepherd, may we embody who you are. To feel your love, give us our daily bread. And Alleluia is God with us. God is with the poor, and power in the meat. We all have each other. God is my shepherd, I won't 
Reading from Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. God, are you avoiding me, failing in my hour of need? 
I'm crying out for help Do you hide yourself In times of trouble Pride and greed have captured me Wickedness is all I see I am calling out to you Do you hear my prayer In times of trouble Rise up Rise up Lift your head All I see is war and pain A child's life killed in vain They were crying out for help Did you hear their prayer In times of trouble Rise up Rise up, lift your hand Rise up, rise up, lift your hand Do not forget your promise Do not forget your promise Do you hear our prayers in times of trouble I ask God a prayer today Looking for an answer Knowing war is raging on Christians killing brothers God, why don't you intervene And help those who are suffering I hear silence I asked God a prayer today Crying out for mercy A little child holding on Sickness overtaking Please Lord won't you intervene Help the child suffering I hear silence What will you do? What will you do? I ask God a prayer today Though I'm tired praying How can I still pray to God While this world is burning Hosanna 
I hear silence All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. Personality nor nationality. Count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. Oh, <laughs> 
riches and power and praise Your song ringing in all your ways You can do what you want But my prayer is that you do it in me Give me water to drink Give me bread to eat Not just for my body But for my spirit in need And I know that time after time you have forgiven me Help me to let go of others that have offended me. Father, lead me, Father, guide me. Lead me to the light and away from the darkness. But deliver me. Cause I know the evil one is out for me. Seeking to devour me, God. table before me in the presence of my enemies God deliver me deliver me cause I know yours is the kingdom let it be let it be let it be let it be and I know yours Would you join me in the generosity prayer? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, now it's time to offer grace and peace. So please extend grace and peace to those around you and to anyone who may be far away. Good morning once again. Welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Redzina. I'm one of the pastors here. And today our reading is from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 7. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he did not or could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit 
immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him, and he took him aside in private, away from the crowd. He put his finger into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue, and then he looked up to heaven. He sighed, and he said to him, Eptatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened. His tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He's done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now that we have read our gospel story, we take a moment as a community to pause and reflect on this moment that we share. We center ourselves in the present moment, allowing our hearts to open up to God and to the possibility that this story could speak to our story in a way that makes a difference and that's transformative. So would you join me now as best as you know how with whatever faith or doubt you bring into this moment? Bring it authentically to God. God, we pray that you would take the story of Jesus and make it fresh for us today and this week and in this season of our lives. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes it is the transgressive encounter that is the transformative encounter. Sometimes we have to break the rules to break open our hearts or other people's hearts. You could argue that this was Jesus' primary way of being. But it does raise a couple of questions for people like us trying to follow Jesus in places like New York City and wherever you live. And that is, what code, what rules would Jesus invite us to transgress? And additionally, how are we transformed as we do it? Humans are extremely tribal. We love to learn, and in fact, we have learned how to survive through intuitive and rather often complex boundaries and codes that have evolved over time. These are the kinds of dynamics we talked about last week, creating distinctions between things that are clean, things that are unclean. The codes that regulate that sort of disgust mechanism within us which is a boundary emotion, determining what is inside appropriately and what is appropriately outside. And it does so for our protection. These boundaries protect us from physical contamination, of course. We all know the gag reflex when we taste something bitter or something that could be toxic to us or smell the same. But the practice stretches out well beyond the physical. And as we looked at last week, it stretches into the moral and into the social dimensions of life. The shadow of that sort of protective survival instinct is that we tend to separate from uh, those who are socially or morally different from us. We tend to moralize the boundaries that we draw between our group and the other group. And it breeds a kind of hostility or contempt for the outsider. 
And people beyond our boundaries, people who violate the codes that we hold dear, are perceived as contaminants. I can remember sitting outside of Tiny's restaurant in Tribeca, talking with a parishioner. This is probably six or seven years ago. We were talking about sexual ethics. And we were talking about the challenge in the Christian church over the years of trying to discern uh, what is to be done and how uh, things should be understood when it came to sexual orientation and things like gender identity. And one of the impulses that the person across the table had was indeed one of disgust and one of contamination. Even if we made space for difference on this issue within our community, it wasn't enough for this person. They needed a hard line, they needed a boundary to be enforced in order to feel clean. In fact, they felt like they couldn't continue to participate with our community or call our community their own unless we in fact drew that line. For them, the contaminant is not something to be co-mingled with. It didn't fall in the category for them of Jesus' teaching of the parable of the wheat and the weeds, where he says, you should let them grow together. Jesus, in our story today, is approaching Gentile towns. And these are, of course, towns that are symbolically hostile to Israel, specifically Tyre and Sidon. These are cities named explicitly by the prophets of Israel over time as symbolic of the hostility and the evil and the contamination perceived beyond the camp. And it's here that he's approached by a woman. She asks for help, and by all accounts, I mean, just reading the story at face value, it seems that she's ignored. But she persists. And in her persistence, we kind of marvel as we watch. And Jesus, in fact, himself marvels at one point. This persistence, which uh, the disciples offer that familiar advice, uh, heard from them in the wilderness, send them away. Um, this is becoming a pattern. It's becoming a motif uh, within the gospel's depiction of the disciples. Send them away is the basic human instinct in the face of annoyance. It's what we feel and what we do in the face of complicated differences. And it is, especially when our disgust sensor is triggered, how we resolve things. Let them go away, right? Send them away. This has been the pattern of church polity uh, within various traditions. When people who believe or behave in ways that are different from the status quo or the moral ideal, the gut response is simply send them away. We even use righteous language and processes to do it. And this is because those lines of clean and unclean are some of the most powerful symbolic lines in human psychology. We may think that we are more civilized than the primitive people who had codes of clean and unclean pertaining to dietary laws or ritual washings, but they're alive and well today. People who would cringe at the mixing of behaviors like eating shrimp or bacon or wearing mixed fabrics and put that in the unclean category, uh, but we have our own cultural, religious, uh, cultural codes, religious or not. We've certainly used this example before, but there's the old Dixie cup test uh, where people are told to spit in the Dixie cup and then uh, they're told to drink the contents of the cup. Uh, minutes before that, they're simply asked to consciously swallow. And what they're told, of course, when they, most of them respond with a sense of repulsion or disgust at the idea of drinking their own spit, they're reminded that just moments before, they did the same thing. They swallowed the same uh, contents with no problem. And that's because in human psychology, saliva, when it's inside the mouth, is not spit, it's saliva. But as soon as it breaks the boundary of the body, even just for a moment, even in a clean Dixie cup, something happens in the brain that immediately renders it unclean and worthy of repulsion or disgust. This dynamic is all over the place, especially in our conflicts and in our political climate 
this year. These codes show up in the ways that we're embarrassed. They show up in what we hide from others. They show up in what makes us feel shame or maybe reminds us of our shame or our, and ultimately that sense or that reason that we feel like we may not belong to a particular group or we may not belong in our life or our world. We draw boundaries around what we consider good or clean or safe, and then we focus our energy and our attention on those things, and we often ignore what is beyond the boundaries, or worse, we villainize people beyond them. And that is the great challenge of the state of Christianity today. That sense of apathy beyond our group, beyond our community, or the sense of hostility toward those beyond us. In this story, when approached by a persistent, unclean outsider, Jesus himself owns the focus and the boundary of his life and mission up to this point. It's been the people of Israel. This isn't just a specific demographic of people that Jesus is targeting from a market perspective. It's a phrase that's used widely to describe an entire people struggling under bad leadership. And Jesus essentially says, listen, this is not my problem. I appreciate what you're doing, but this is not my problem, right? These are my people. There is my mission. But remarkably, this woman, against cultural rules and mores, persists in pleading for help. And then Jesus offers a troubling saying, to be honest. It's one that appears to solidify his posture of resistance to the woman. He says, quote, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now Jesus, like all Israelites of his time, inherited his spirituality, inherited a culture, inherited a vocabulary that looked on Gentiles with suspicion and sometimes with hostility. This was not simply an exclusive ethnocentrism of the powerful, lest we in our enlightened sort of progressive moment in history look back with disdain. Rather, this was a survival mechanism for those who were under the thumb of empire. Jesus, along with Israel, were under Roman occupation, and they were under occupation alongside the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they had a solidarity of being under the occupation with this woman who approaches him. Jesus himself was part of that peasant class. The people who largely uh, were the, the poorer populace, but also uh, the majority within Judaism. But separation was built into the fabric of the Jewish imagination, and it was done so out of survival. This was the way they would preserve their unique identity when other forces and empires would try to squash it or wash it away. Right? This was the way that they would not give in to the forces of empire that threatened to uh, take away or deprive them of their unique stories and customs and dignity. Separation is a very powerful human instinct when it comes to a sense of threat. We want to send them away. We want to create distance. We want to create some kind of boundary. And so I think it's important before we look with judgment on the saying and look with judgment on this imagination that we understand with compassion the reason it's there in the first place. When we're able to exercise that kind of compassion rather than judge, we can then turn our eyes to our current cultural moment and even to our own lives and look at our own boundaries, look at our own disgust reactions and separations, and we can have compassion there as well. Compassion and the kindness that comes with that kind of compassion is the beginning of healing. It is the beginning of the possibility of transformation. And that's why the Bible teaches that kindness leads to repentance. Jesus here defies the common logic of his people that certain activities contaminate you. He concludes it's not what you put into your body, as we looked at last week, that makes you unclean and isn't washing your hands that makes you clean. Instead, Jesus focuses on the heart and says, it's what you find here that makes you clean or unclean. 
And so Jesus is seen to be resisting the purity system, and yet here, Jesus is put to the test. In the same way we were challenged in a positive way by Jesus, here we see that Jesus was seemingly susceptible to the same challenges and limits of his humanity and his culture. Jesus was said in the Gospels to have grown in wisdom and stature, which means he faced limits constantly and yet was able to grow and evolve and stretch as a human being. That's part of the mystery of the incarnation. Jesus was profoundly human just as you and I. And yet, of course, we also believe that Jesus was divine. And so here, as part of this spirituality of separateness, outsiders were often referred to in derogatory ways. Gentiles were referred to commonly as dogs. And this was a a tremendous insult, easy to miss when people read by us who live in a culture where basically dogs are uh, worthy of clothing and uh, they eat expensive vegan gourmet and we stroll them around in literal strollers in Manhattan like royalty. No, in Jesus' time, dogs were mangy scavengers. They were unkept, they were untrained, they were wild, and in Jewish practice they were considered unclean. You touch a dog and then you can't worship that night unless you go through the correct protocols. So Jesus inherited this perspective, inherited this cultural limitation, and yet here uh, the, the same limitation that would have had Jewish males praying this prayer, thanking God for not making them a woman and not making them a Gentile. He inherited the suspicious culture and the derogatory rhetoric. And now his ideas up to this point, and even his practice, have been swimming upstream against this ethnocentrism, right? against this way that boundaries are created and sustained by our disgust emotion. But they hadn't been truly put to the test yet in this gospel story for Jesus. The story seems to want to highlight the symbolic importance of this encounter. Consider Matthew's account, where the woman's not called Syrophoenician, which would have been the correct geographic identity of Jesus' time, but where she is called a Canaanite. And that would have been an anachronism, right? There were no such thing as Canaanites in Jesus' time. That was part of Israel's history. It symbolically represented the enemies, right? The people to be conquered in the promised land. But Matthew's showing us a pivot in Jesus' ministry, and the gospel writer here is as well. Jesus had established his commitment to clearly care for and include and heal and feed his own people. And the gospel story has alluded that this ministry would be extended to all. But this is the true first movement of Jesus toward the Gentiles and all of humanity even our perceived enemies. The use of Canaanite in Matthew's language as a term would have brought to mind the story of the conquest. It would have been uh, a reminder of the people of Israel when they had been delivered from Egyptian tyranny. And under the leadership of Moses, they were provided for in the wilderness. But then under Joshua's leadership, they see the people of Canaan as the enemy. And they, at their time with their limits, interpret God as one who is passionately on their side and showing no mercy to the enemy. Moses tells the people in Deuteronomy as they're about to enter Canaan under Joshua's leadership, and this is difficult to hear. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're about to enter and occupy, and he clears away the many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations, mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must make no covenant with them, and you must show them no mercy. It is one of those dynamics that's been true throughout history that the oppressors, because of the pain, I'm sorry, the oppressed, because of their pain and their woundedness, often, when they get power, become the oppressor. And Matthew, Mark, the gospel story, and even Jesus in this moment, under the guidance of God's Spirit, 
is challenging this understanding of God. And it's challenging in portraying Jesus as the new Joshua. Remember, Jesus shares Joshua's name. He would have been referred to as Yeshua. Jesus is one who doesn't dominate, who doesn't bring death to his enemies when he has the upper hand. Nor does he promote separation. But instead, he gives his life for his enemies. And he promotes transgressive encounters across these boundaries, across these lines of separation created by our codes. He instills in them the value of intentionally doing the hard work of self-reflection. When we bump up against difference, when we feel that those clean and unclean categories start to fire in our imaginations and activated within us, when we feel the disgust bubbling up in our souls, Jesus wants us to pause and consider a new way, a new perspective. This story is a warning to the oppressors to listen to the voice of the margins and to be transformed by them. But it's also a parable for the oppressed to resist the spirituality that would turn you into an oppressor when you gain power. As we said, there's often moments in our lives when we are dared to be more human in the midst of an inhuman circumstance or culture. Jesus was no exception. Jesus is said in the Bible, as we've said, to to have grown in wisdom and stature. He grew, he learned like every one of us, and yet the Bible retains this idea that he was tempted and yet without sin. And so I hold these two in tension as I read this story. Uh, I've told this story before, but uh, when I was in elementary school, uh, there was a girl in my class who had a sort of disgusting reputation. Uh, She was perceived uh, to be picking her boogers and eating them in class, and this, of course, is a death sentence, uh, socially speaking, for anyone in the fourth grade. And everybody teased her for it, and I didn't you know, particularly like the teasing as a kid, and yet the mob mentality, uh, you know, had its effect on me. And there were times when I might have added my words or my look of disgust uh, to my classmate. At one point, she yelled at the class to, um, to stop teasing her, and then someone yelled at her, well, stop picking your boogers. And she yelled, it's not, I'm not picking my boogers, and her face was beet red. And with that, the girl whipped her head around, and she put her head in her hands and arms, and she cried. Later, I would learn uh, that, uh, later I would approach her with an apology, um, and she was super gracious. Um, She basically explained that she had this nervous habit of biting her nails, and so she would you know, essentially wipe them, uh, file them on her shirt and kind of mess with them like this. And people interpreted her playing like this as sort of molding her boogers and then wiping them on her shirt. And it was one of those moments in my life, like many others after it, where this encounter led to a transformation of imagination. Right? I saw and experienced the way that bullying and scapegoating had shaped me and had done so in a way that was harming and hurting another person. Humans easily create stories to push other people down or out. And there are often moments in our lives where we're dared to be more human than that, to grow in our humanity, to be healed and transformed. And this often happens through transgressive encounters. I had the good fortune of being able to have that transgressive encounter. She was considered unclean in my class, and yet something in me said, you gotta apologize to her. And it was that transgressive encounter that became transformative for me. I can't explain away Jesus so easily, like many conservative scholars especially do, suggesting Jesus was merely testing her faith, that he didn't uh, you know, mean anything uh, derogatory by that comment about dogs. And I honestly uh, don't want to get into too much of that debate. I just want to say, I think we're meant to hold the tension here. I can't quite jump onto the train of the other commentators either, who sort of look at Jesus uh, as using a racial slur and needing to repent. Rather, I like to leave this in the realm of mystery, of 
that thing that's so difficult for us to understand of what it means for God to uh, take on the limits of humanity in human experience and to bear witness to the light of God's love through the incarnation. But perhaps we can learn powerfully from Jesus' example here. Perhaps we can take heed to the tension that exists in the story, the tension of the codes, the, contention, the tension of that temptation for all of us to ignore or be hostile to the outsider. And maybe we can watch as Jesus himself is moved and marvels at this woman's faith and persistence. He is caught aback by her savvy banter, and it alters the trajectory of his mission. I wonder this week if you would have the same kind of eyes, maybe the same kind of sensitivity uh, to take yourself out of autopilot and to learn how to listen to other voices beyond your, your boundaries, beyond your codes. I wonder if you could learn this week where you could violate those codes, where you can transgress them in order to experience some transformation. Because when we transgress these social and moral codes, not only are we transformed, but the people that we engage, the people that we humanize, they themselves are transformed as well. In this case, Jesus' mission is expanded and we all benefit from that. But this woman, her daughter is healed and restored and there's a social integration that follows. It's always a mutually healing experience when we cross these lines of divide in the name of Jesus in order to grow and to learn and to find and see our, our solidarity as made and loved by God. And so I pray that God, by the Holy Spirit, empowers us this week to continue to see those lines, to pay attention to them within us, to watch the dynamic itself unfold, and to resist it, to pivot, and to change. Amen. And now that we've reflected on our gospel story, we take a moment to declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. It's one of the earliest compressions of Jesus' story that we have, and whether you bring a lot of faith or a lot of doubt, we simply say it in an act of solidarity with those who have carried this story before us and those who will carry it after. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we have declared our faith, we offer our prayers. These are the prayers of the people. And now will you join me in the prayers of the people? We pray for a broken world. We pray through our feelings of hopelessness and cynicism to a place of possibility. We pray that the eyes of the confused, the eyes of the deceived, the eyes of the angry and aggrieved be miraculously opened, that their hearts be softened. We pray for a collective recognition that whatever the question, love is the answer. We pray for those who grieve, whose hearts are heavy with mourning. We pray for those who are sick, those who are slipping away. We pray your peace would envelop them. We pray, dear Lord, for the comfort of your presence, real and unmistakable, the assurance of your love in this world and the next. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders. We pray for leaders of churches and schools, of families, of companies, of nations, of movements. We pray whatever power or influence we have, wherever we have it, that we would exercise it with humility and wisdom, kindness and tenderness, with generous heapings of love and grace. Lord, give us courage to lead and humility to follow and wisdom to know which is the path you have chosen for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the spirit of truth, your spirit, to make itself known in our world and in our midst and in our innermost places. 
Help us to desire truth without fear, to look to you to find it, to make our demands for integrity and justice as pressing within ourselves as they are for the outside world. We pray for bravery in seeing where we fall short and where we can be better, with confidence in your love, acceptance, and forgiveness. We thank you for being a God whose mercies never fail, but are new every morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now that we have prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Confession is simply naming and taking responsibility for the ways in which we have fallen short of love. It's not a cosmic beatdown or morbid introspection. It's an act of holy memory. We're going to begin with a sense of God's kindness and mercy and invite the Holy Spirit to lead you to something done or left undone this week that has cut against the grain of love. Take a moment now to consider the week behind you and ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you towards a memory that matters. Let's take a moment now. And as we hold these memories tenderly in the presence of God's mercy, know that you are not alone. Together we pray this corporate confession in an act of solidarity. Join me in this prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. And now hear the good news of Jesus, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards us. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. You are loved, you are included, you are welcome, and you are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to the table, to the meal that Jesus gave us, what we call Holy Communion. And we begin with an ancient prayer of gratitude. Join me in this prayer. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyous thing to say thank you at all times. But now as a community, we pause to give thanks for all the good gifts of our lives. We especially thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, and to set the captives free. We thank you that through his life, death, and resurrection, you have shown us the height, width, and depth of your love for everything you have made, and the triumph of that love to overcome sin and death. And so we lift up our hearts with the angels and archangels of Isaiah, the prophet's vision, who continually cry out, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy word, that these gifts of bread and cup would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, after the supper, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We pray that you would grace us with your love as we receive this bread, and that we would likewise be broken and given for the sake of our neighbor. Amen. Also after the supper, Jesus took the cup and blessed it, saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which speaks a better word than our violence and revenge, and instead points us to your way of peace and forgiveness. Give us grace and power to embody your way as we receive the cup. Amen. And now together we declare the mystery of faith. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God. Amen. And now we invite you to receive Holy Communion. Our practice as a community is an open table. If you feel drawn to the love that you see in Christ, you are welcome to this meal. So let this be a gesture of your open heart to receive the love that you find there. Take a moment to celebrate communion. Take your bread and dip it in your cup. Body of Christ broken for you, blood of Christ given for you. Amen. Now receive this benediction. As you have received the seeds of faith and hope, go now into God's world to scatter the seeds of reconciliation and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Praise God from whom all blessings Thank you.
tilting while gasoline. 